conflict prevention, recognizing the continuum between honor-based and institutionalized system. My name is Tanner Rosendahl. I'm a first-year neuroscience major in the Clark Honors College. I will be presenting my work in the field of cultural anthropology and media studies. Let's start with an overview and agenda for the presentation today. First, I will answer what is revenge? Why is it important? What are the values of honor-based and non-honor cultures? What are the consequences of isolating cultural norms as depicted in the Spanish tragedy? What is the significance of a cultural continuum in modern society? Revenge. Before we go further, I need to address and define revenge. Specifically, what is it and why is it important? In a 1990 article titled Norms of Revenge, John Elster defined revenge as, quote, the attempt at some cost or risk to oneself to impose suffering upon those who have made one suffer because they have made one suffer. It was this definition I used to guide my research. Elster makes the case that revenge has no tangible benefits. It comes at a risk or cost to the individual. For this reason, rational people avoid revenge when acting in their best interest. However, revenge is inevitable in a variety of ways, which is ultimately the result of failing to control an impulse of emotion. Despite revenge being an irrational behavior, its expression is strongly governed by social norms. Previous scholarship distinguishes two different social frameworks, one in honor-based societies and the other expressed in non-honor institutionalized systems. Yet one of the most important components of revenge is its universality. All humans behave irrationally at some point in their lives. Therefore, revenge is a consistent medium used to interpret and understand the social norms of a society. Shakespeare said, If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? Now, of course, revenge exists on a spectrum. Displayed here are two examples of revenge between two civilians within the community. The left depicts poor parking, and the right takes revenge on a package thief. Both are inherently harmless and even comical. In comparison, revenge exists on a larger scale, such as the current Ukrainian war. While Putin believes parts of Russia belong to him, Ukrainians disagree, declaring their independence from Russia. The revenge from this ideological disagreement between countries is far more devastating. Pictured here is a civilian after missile strike and the destruction of infrastructure in Ukraine. Evidently, revenge is a universal phenomenon existing on a range of scales. I use revenge in my research to study cultural differences within a society. Now I will turn to the different interpretations of revenge identified in my research. Specifically, how do honor cultures interpret revenge? Honor cultures were identified by Tamler Summers in a paper titled Moral Responsibility in the Culture of Honor. Firstly, these societies are often small and lack a centralized government. Without broad oversight, societies tend to rely on close bonds with kin to maintain civil compliance. In addition, the competition for scarce resources makes collaboration with strangers rare. Another defining characteristic of these societies is the importance of honor and reputation as we will frequently turn to violence and revenge to set boundaries and, most importantly, maintain their honor. Lastly, third-party retribution is shameful precisely because the act of personal revenge is the acceptable convention in honor societies. In this way, the importance of honor contributes to the socially acceptable norms of revenge. I found examples of these expectations in the honor-based Albanian Highlander society where a man slow to kill his enemy was disgraced and not permitted to appear in public. Additionally, the mobster Anthony James was part of an inner-city U.S. gang and was furious when a man was apprehended by authorities for killing his half-brother. He would have preferred street justice over third-party interference. These examples illustrate the two primary features of honor-based societies. One, revenge is normalized, and two, third-party retribution is rejected. These societies exist all around the world and are typical of herding populations, tribal communities, or inner city teams. For example, the Yanomami people in Venezuela are a tribal population who participate in acts of blood revenge, where men kill members of an opposing tribe after being threatened or dishonored. This behavior is recognized as honorable, as Yunokais, or those participating in blood revenge acts, are more attractive and desirable for women in the tribe. Additionally, Israeli and Palestinians are currently engaged in tense conflicts over the rights of their religious beliefs and borders. 
both of these cultures have characteristics of honor-based societies as they celebrate personal sacrifice over third-party retribution. In the U.S., gangs such as MS-13, who Trump famously targeted in 2016, are built upon honor-based systems and their preference for street justice rather than police intervention. Now I'll move to the norms of revenge for non-honor and institutionalized systems, which are more recognizable for Western society. In contrast to honor-based cultures, institutionalized systems have economies built upon cooperation with others. Thus, there is significant collaboration between strangers. Secondly, private revenge is perceived as taboo and regarded as an act of primitive behavior. As a result, non-honor cultures rely on third-party systems to govern the norms and expectations of a society. This is opposite from honor cultures. While the fundamentals of non-honor systems are opposite of honor-based cultures, the two share a desire for revenge. The only true difference is the pejorative connotations in Western society, resulting in softer words such as grievance, retribution, or justice used to describe the innate desire for revenge. These characteristics are once again familiar to Western societies. For example, Fox News recently paid nearly $800 million after Dominion voting systems filed a defamation lawsuit. This type of punishment is common in non-honor cultures, but not feasible or desired in small honor-based communities. Another example that illustrates the importance of third-party retribution is capital punishment, the ultimate price for crime in the U.S. Despite its controversy, this legal form of killing is permitted in over half the U.S. states and has been performed nearly 1,000 times since 2000, according to data from Statistica. This number is far lower than the revenge-related deaths in honor cultures. While third-party retribution is required for justice, private revenge is regarded as taboo and permitted. For this reason, people often turn to modern escapist entertainment in movies and literature with central themes for revenge. One example is the popular book, movie, and play Carrie by Stephen King, which depicts the destruction of a town after the revenge of a telekinetic teenage girl. These forms of media are entertaining because they permit what is otherwise unacceptable in society. In honor-based systems, these displays of revenge would not have the same entertainment value as they are perceived responsibilities for the average citizen. Examples of these non honor cultures include democracies, judicial systems, financial institutions, corporate businesses, and the education sector, all of whom have the characteristics previously described and rely on third-party systems for retribution and organized governance. While previous anthropological work has separated honor and non honor cultures based on their social norms, I argue this binary perspective, typical of Western cultures, is misleading. Instead, there exists a cultural continuum between honor-based and institutionalized systems, each intertwined and subtly influencing the other. My research suggests neglecting this continuum leaves a society prone to violence and civil defiance. To investigate this phenomenon, I use my understanding of honor-based and non-honor cultures to analyze revenge in Thomas Kidd's 1587 play, The Spanish Tragedy. In this play, a Spanish soldier named Andrea is killed in a battle fighting against the Portuguese forces. He returns from the underworld as a ghost, seeking revenge, and his actions result in the murder, suicide, and chaos, and neither institutionalized systems nor personal revenge satisfy his desires. This case study was used to investigate the consequences of institutionalized systems failing to recognize honor-based cultures and the cultural continuum previously defined. This play was the first in a genre called Revenge Tragedies, which were popular in the 15th to 16th centuries throughout the Elizabethan and Jacobian eras. The play reflected the strong Christian ideological values of the time, as God was perceived as the ultimate authority. In addition, kings and high courts were responsible for setting rules and punishing those who broke them. These qualities are characteristics of the dominant institutionalized system. There were also characteristics of honor-based cultures in the play. Prior revenge, as nearly, by nearly every character, reflects the importance of honor for those living in this era. This play was an excellent case study because the values of honor-based cultures subtly influenced a larger institutionalized system. Indeed, this is similar to the modern composition of Western democracies with a larger governing body and oftentimes overlooked influences of honor cultures within the U.S. By incorporating components of both institutionalized and honor-based system, Thomas Kidd critiques the conventional binary approach to maintaining order. In the play, Kidd mocks God by creating a character named Revenge who haphazardly judges the characters in the afterlife. K 
Kit also highlights the disorder and chaos when characters take revenge into their own hands, as nine are killed throughout the play. In this way, the Spanish tragedy suggests neither institutionalized systems nor personal revenge in isolation are capable of maintaining order. The consequence of this binary perspective regarding governance is violence and chaos. While this may be true in the 16th century, how is it relevant today? I suggest respecting cultural diversity and recognizing this cultural continuum is key to preventing conflict, maintaining civil compliance, and encouraging social cohesion in Western society. Take for example the recent emphasis on socioeconomic diversity in school and the workplace. Respecting the range of opinions in both of these scenarios is necessary for a healthy, vibrant, and productive environment. Another application is through the diversification of culinary choices. Food is required for life and unites us all. If we acknowledge a spectrum of cultures living within the U.S. by providing a range of cuisines, we can create a more inviting and welcoming community. Media and artistic expression are yet another example. Each individual and cultural perceives beauty differently. Acknowledging and celebrating these differences contributes to a more cohesive environment. Beyond these small changes, respecting the cultural continuum can reorient foreign policy. Western cultures are often blinded by ethnocentrism, assuming other cultures want and need our help. If we stop to understand the cultural values of foreign countries, we can implement policies that are more likely to be successful. For example, we've long struggled to gain a foothold in Iraq. This failure is a result of not understanding the moral motivations for its citizens of this honor-based honor culture. In addition, domestic legislation can be modified to recognize the honor cultures within the U.S. In doing so, conflict and violence can be prevented because the values of all parties will be incorporated in legal frameworks. My research suggests respecting the cultural continuum can prevent conflict, maintain civil compliance, and most importantly, encourage social cohesion in Western society. Future research should identify specific legislation that incorporates values of both honor-based and institutionalized systems to achieve the desired result. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Ulrich Casimir for his guidance in the research process. The sources I use in the project are as follows.